this is really a, already a great success. There are more people in audience than on the podium. So that's a really good sign to begin with. So we are really excited about this uh, autonomy panel. We want to share with you the leading thoughts from the leading thought leaders in the world, pretty much, on autonomy, what's going on. So let me introduce you to our great panelists here. So first is Arthur Dubois. He's the Vice President of Engineering at X-Wing, which is a company that's focused on human mobility through use of uncrewed autonomous airplanes. He's an experienced aviation leader. He's worked on several groundbreaking aerospace con projects and concepts. E. V. Tall at Joby and Kitty Hawk and now unmanned aircraft at Wing. So, and he also has a strong background and is a strong advocate of urban and regional air mobility, and he believes in, obviously, autonomy and electrification. And he's got degrees from schools that you have never heard of. Stanford, I think, is one, and McGill is another one. So, welcome. So, next one is David Ard. David is a policy manager at WISC. He leads the development and execution of strategies to shape legislation, regulation, public policies, and focused on enabling autonomous flight and operations in a safe manner in the national airspace system. He holds a bachelor's degree in uh, business administration and aviation management from North Dakota and master's from Boise State University. So before uh, WISC, he was at Lilium and he also worked at AOPA and many other places, so Oshkosh, EA, and such. So he's got a good pedigree into rulemaking and advocacy and such. So we got great to have you, David. Third is Igor Cherepensky, his director at Sikorsky you know, Innovations, which is a Lockheed Martin company, as you know. Um, he heads the innovation group and he's tasked with solving the toughest problems in vertical flight. Uh, so he's, we are really excited to have him here. Uh, he still has some black hair left, so he's got plenty of problems to solve. So under his leadership, we are looking forward to multidisciplinary, basically, problem solving. And currently, he's maturing next generation of technologies, process, and products to, to bring unprecedented level of autonomy, system intelligence, safety, and maneuverability, maneuverability to the large rotorcraft, as well as electric propulsion and hybrid electric propulsion. So the welcome, Igor. And last, not the least, Brandon Suarez, who leads aerospace integration development and standardization at Reliable Robotics. He is co-chair of RTCA Special Committee 228. I'm sure some of you have already interacted with him in that, and his passion and enthusiasm in the committee is very well known. The committee actually works only because of his leadership, in my view. But, um, he has participated on many FAA aviation rulemaking committees, as well as he's an advisor to ICAO's RPAS panel. He is instrument rated commercial pilot, and he has bachelor's and master's from another little university called MIT in aerospace engineering. So welcome. With that quick introduction, we're going to start off with basically giving the podium to each panelist, have them start off with uh, a little bit more background on what their company is after, what they're doing. Can you introduce yourself? Yes, I can introduce myself. So my name is Parimal Kopardegar. I My user-friendly name is PK, and I am Advanced Air Mobility Mission Integration Manager, among other things at NASA. And I'm very excited about Advanced Air Mobility at large, making sure that uh, Advanced Air Mobility occurs and I cover aircraft, airspace, infrastructure, sort of ecosystem view mostly, and making sure that the research products that we are building inside NASA are relevant to industry and FIA and other government organizations. Uh, my other job is I'm also director of NASA Aeronautics Research Institute where we look for new trends like wildfire and how pressing needs that happen in today's world and how do we bring aviation to solve those complex problems. So that's my little background. 
and I'm excited to, to be here. Obviously, this is a great uh, company to be. So we'll hand it back to Arthur, start with you. All right, test. Cool. Well, I'm going to try to keep people awake here right after lunch. Uh, like PK said, I'm Arthur Dubray. I lead the engineering team at X-Wing. So for those who are not familiar with X-Wing, we're based in the, uh, the, the Bay Area. And we're in company, a company focused on you know, developing um, autonomy solutions for aviation. Uh, I, I think we all share a pretty common end goal here and a vision that um, autonomy can really expand aviation uh, in, in a variety of dimensions. Uh, the, the way we're doing this is by trying to build uh, uncrewed aircraft systems. So think of it as a fairly aircraft agnostic system that can be installed on a variety of platforms. Uh, we're, we're currently certifying that on a Cessna uh, 208. Um, and, and really the way we want to approach this is trying to roll out a pretty complete autonomy system from day one. So, and, and by autonomy, I mean really taking the pilot away from the cockpit. Uh, and, and, and that means you know, integrating a variety of, of functions into our system. It means obviously flying the aircraft and take off to touchdown, uh, but it also means making decisions, detecting and avoiding other aircraft, monitoring the health of the system, uh, and, and, and obviously you know, managing all the contingencies and the things that can go wrong uh, on board. Uh, so so we're, we're not completely crazy in the sense that we don't think this technology is gonna roll out on necessarily passenger operations for urban air mobility tomorrow. So, so the way we're approaching this is trying to develop this fully certified uncrewed aircraft system in, in, in sort of rolling it out incrementally, starting with kind of really kind of corner cases operationally. So really things like uncrewed cargo over unpopulated areas, dirty and dangerous jobs, uh, and then really trying to expand our way towards more complex and complex operations uh, all the way until uh, we're able to do pretty complex operations with passengers, potentially in urban areas and so on and so forth. So uh, that, that's our, our angle to this kind of fairly complex autonomy problem. All right, thank you, Arthur. Now we will go to David. David has a few slides. I, I do, I thought, you know, for lunch especially, you know, you might want to look at something. I, I would have brought videos, but... Uh, so uh, the aircraft that you see on the screen is our Generation 6 aircraft. That's the aircraft that we actually have. Our model downstairs in Haldi, so if you haven't seen it already, by all means, we'd encourage you to stop by. That is a four-passenger aircraft. It is autonomous, so no pilot on board. But we do have crew. Uh, we are not getting rid of crew. Uh, he or she will just be located on the ground. They'll be supervising that flight, but the aircraft really does fly itself. Very defined mission, which I'll go into a little bit later. Sixth generation, which means we've had previous generations. Uh, so our previous five generations have flown over 1,800 flights to date. Uh, we've been at this for a pretty long time, over 13 years, so we're definitely not new. Uh, recently, over the last year, we were required fully by the Boeing company. We originally had a uh, partnership, a joint venture, but uh, Boeing uh, acquired us, and that has been a very strong strategic partnership that has really lended itself to, to giving a lot of shared learnings on, on how to certificate, build, and, and build an aircraft that's safe, but most importantly, uh, on the autonomy piece. So with that, uh, the first thing is, obviously safety first always a lot of people ask you know why autonomy is it for you know reduce costs and and yes that's that's part of it but first and foremost we are going straight to autonomy because of the safety aspect. Many of my fellow colleagues in the AEM space, they all have autonomy in their roadmap. I think to really truly scale this industry and scale it safely, you really have to go to autonomy for such a defined mission, point A to point B in that urban environment. You know, and then there are things that allow that to really scale digital aviation, new flight rules, new providers of service for ATM, but there's a lot of thing. But it is different. Like I said, it's different than some of my colleagues who are going piloted via far first but again we think it's that we're doing it for a few reasons first highest level of possible safety that's for our approach uh, we really think that's really important second again not gritting get it ringer to crew but it's really an autonomous flight with the human oversight we're doing exactly the same functions and tasks that a pilot will do today at altitude on, on autopilot he or she's just now located on the ground the point is developing an aircraft from scratch the reliance is never on the pilot to save the day in the end. If something does happen to regular operations, emergency operations, the systems and the aircraft take part of it. However, that person on the ground 
if they need to intervene, they can. They will talk to air traffic control. They can adjust course. They can move the aircraft if they need to, but it's not through a stick or a rudder. It's through a keyboard or a mouse. No single point of failure. Obviously, these are electric aircraft, very few moving parts. That's, that's first and foremost, but also simplified design. But yeah, safety first and foremost, but allows for scalability. Uh, there is a pilot shortage. Uh, maybe some don't believe it, but I think there is. We don't want to compete with that pilot shortage, so we want to be additive to this market. Additive to the folks downstairs who are not replacing an existing segment of aviation, but really growing the pie. And then obviously improved economics. WISC's motto is safe, everyday flight for everyone, and by the everyone, we want this, this mode of transportation to be accessible and affordable. So we're targeting Uber pricing, and so we can get to the people that maybe not participate in aviation today. Wanted to go wrong with this side because I really like this. You know, when you think about autonomy, it truly is a spectrum. A lot of people, it scares people. Uh, they think, oh, full autonomy, the aircraft will decide where it wants to go. So looking at this chart, you have the pilot in command. Where is he or she located? Is it on the aircraft? or is it on the ground? And then the top axis, you have the pilot command tasks. First, manipulate stick and rudder. A lot of people, I'm a pilot. Any pilots in the room? A couple, great. So we all talk about stick and rudder skills. Um, you know, a lot of people say, really need those stick and rudder skills, so learn how to fly a, a J3 Cub to start, which is fantastic. And you know, I come from AOPA and EAA, so, so pilot through and through. We love those vintage and GA aircraft. And, and yeah, we need those stick rudder skills, but really no levels of automation, no autonomy in those. As far as, you know, the uh, UAS side of it, they're early remote piloted, the things that, you know, the hobby ones, you know, you definitely have to manipulate those aircraft in order to fly it. Moving kind of to the right on the continuum, you look at control, stability, and augmented stick and rudder skills. So you look at, you know, the commercial airliner flight controls that we have today. I think we quickly realized that the pilot can't do everything, so let's augment his or her skills with some of the tasks and the functions of the systems. And then on the ground, you look at early defense UAS applications and some of the small drones like the G DJI Phantom. I mean, my son is 11 and he can fly a UAS, a small UAS pretty quickly without little to no training. So that's kind of the point there. Moving to the right uh, for the pilot on the airplane command waypoints. Commercial Airlines, obviously you have a whole flight director, you have a whole program, which is all baked into that aircraft, and then the aircraft flies pretty much itself, again, with that supervision of crew, which is first and foremost and the most important thing, but they are there to monitor, supervise the systems, and then ensure that that aircraft really does fly then to the mission. On the ground, you have the modern defense UAS, the current air traffic management systems, but also WISC. Our Generation 5 core, if anyone's at Oshkosh, that we flew it at Oshkosh, we flew it at Long Beach, and that's exactly how that aircraft flies, um, to find mission, to find waypoints along. But then when you move a little bit to the right, now we're getting that kind of the yellow, which is a little bit uncharted because the policy and regulations aren't quite there yet. We are all working very hard on this, on this, ta on this uh, stage to ensure that the policies and regulations can keep pace with technologies. I think we all would admit that we can fit into today's regulatory frameworks today, but in truly to scale and scale uh, at, in a safe way, we need a little bit of, of tweaks. We need the U.S. to lead, lean in on autonomy. So you look at when the pilot is on there, so you're looking at advanced autopilots, future decks. But then on the bottom, that's our focus. That's what WISC is really focused on. And I think if we do this right, we see application to the, the larger uh, equipment, application to maybe a Boeing product, a future Boeing product. But that's where, you know, ultimately the intent, again, is safety. Most importantly, though, if you even move further to the right, we're true automation, full automation, AI, ML, ML, where the uh, person does nothing, that's not feasible. We, at least WISC does not see that as feasible in today's construct. So uh, maybe someday, but right now, that's not where we're going. So really, again, define operation, define mission, which then leads to, we announced last week our first launch city in the U.S. is going to be Sugarland, Texas, which is on the bottom right. Now you have these defined operating sites. It's not like we're looking to f you know, get into the flow of uh, Houston, Hobby, or Bush International, but really these, these either new sites that don't exist today or existing infrastructure, small GA airports like Sugarland or, or heliports that already exist in the network. So now you have an instrument flight procedure that connects that point A to that point B and a very defined instrument flight procedure that gets you to and from and back and forth very much kind of like Pong or like a gondola connecting those two points. We're just removing that wire, moving to that third dimension in a safe, efficient, sustainable, and quiet way.
that's it. Over to Igor. Well, thank you. Thank you, David. I uh, appreciate the slides. Go over to Igor. Thank you, PK. Thank you, David. So good afternoon. As uh, PK said, looks like everybody's awake, so that's, that, that, that's good. Um, so I'll try not to put people to sleep. Um, so Sikorsky Innovations, we have maybe a slightly different take, right? So Sikorsky has been manufacturing helicopters for, well, 101 years, actually. Last year was our 100th anniversary. Um, what are we doing? Um, we have been working on autonomy and really was, was a focus on safety for the last uh, nine years. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen. Uh, we have now flown in 11 different aircraft. Interestingly enough, some fixed wings, uh, just because to close the business case to invest in autonomy, um, pure VTOL, pure helicopters aren't enough. So for example, we're currently certifying our matrix autonomy system, actually on ATR-42 of all things. If you would have asked me that you know, eight years ago, would I be doing that? The answer probably would have been, I don't think so, but that's what we're doing. Uh, we have also flown our UH-60 with no pilots on board. Again, we, we have you know, never thought we were going to do that because we don't want to send the image of replacing pilots because first and foremost, our focus is safety, um, right? Helicopters and, and really VTOL aircraft um, do a lot of work near the obstacles. So I don't know if I really need to tell anybody in this room. It's a really difficult mission, right? The, the reason why there's a perceived lack of safety in, in, in rotorcraft is because they do very difficult things in, in very difficult environments. I usually say it's kind of like the worst of both worlds, right? It's, it's kind of like being in a car, except you're, you're going, you know, 200 knots, uh, and a lot of times you're doing it at night in bad weather. So, so yes, it, it's, it's a hard job, and we want to really help pilots. So that's how, how our autonomy journey started. As we start to look what it really enables, uh, it is really new configurations and, and new modes of transportation. When electrification kicked in, um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen, we, we announced what our you know, plans for hybrid electrification of VTOL flight looks like. It's, it's tilt wings and other interesting configurations uh, that are coupled with things like autonomy and true single pilot operations to start with. Again, we're, we intend to carry you know, nine to 20 people on board. Uh, so doing it purely uninhabited is, is technically feasible. Uh, but if I truly asked anybody in this room who's willing to get into one of these things and fly from, let's say, New York to Chicago with nobody on board for you know, two and a half hours, uh, my bet is that uh, we wouldn't have a lot of takers to begin with. And, and fully agree with uh, my WIS colleague, that is certainly the goal, right? That, that, that's the idea to do it safely, but can you do it from the start? Maybe, maybe not. So, so we are focused on, on, on making vertical transportation super safe. And, and remember, right, we, we have the unfortunate history of, of having worked with one of the first helicopter airlines. Uh, one of, you know, Sikorsky aircraft has, has a, you know, a misfortune of having fallen off the building in Manhattan. And if you recall, that actually killed the, the civil helicopter transportation for a long, long time. Arguably until today, because there really isn't a true, you know, real helicopter airline like, like in the sense of, you know, Delta, United, or any of those. There, there's plenty, we have plenty of operators who operate S92, 76s, and others, you know, moving people around, but it's not an everyday thing. So interesting enough, I think we all share the same goal, right? We want to get to, to flight that becomes accessible to a lot more people, it becomes a lot safer, and it happens every day, you know, thousands of times a day. So that's what we're up to. Well, thank you, Igor. That's great introduction and good uh, differentiation of how your pedigrees and where you are. It's, it's really, you know, sort of revealing to see companies who are starting now and how they think and companies who have been around for 100 years and evolving to innovation. It's really interesting to see that. Brandon, over to you. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Brandon Suarez. I'm with Reliable Robotics. And um, I just, it just took, you know, 101 years of building helicopters. It really reminds me that we're, uh, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants as we try to take this next step in, in aviation. Um, I was at, I, before joining Reliable Robotics, I was at General Atomics for a while. and. Uh, you know, the work that was done back in the 80s that then laid the groundwork for Predator in the 90s that then led to, you know, the MQ-9 operating all over the world in the 2000s. Um, again, you know, you can kind of look back and it, and it makes sense it, sort of in retrospect how things progressed. And then in real time, you know, it, it made no sense and it was completely chaotic. And, um, and nobody quite knew where things were going to go in the end, but they knew that the technology had to keep advancing and if, if we increase, continue to increase the level of automation on the aircraft, we knew that the systems were going to get safer. And so 
that's where we're, that's really all we're doing today is we're taking the next step. A lot of functions that are done operationally today, either by the pilot, by ATC, um, by procedure design, we're taking those functions and we're putting them onto the aircraft. And of course, that's the hard part from a certification perspective because it's not just um, certifying widgets now and boxes on the airplane. We're actually certifying the operation that that box is going to perform at the same time as we're certifying the box. Um, reliable Robotics, uh, same, same as X-Wing, we're focused on the caravan. The Cessna caravan is really an obvious choice from a fixed wing perspective because it is a ubiquitous aircraft, relatively simple, um, you know, mechanically driven cables and pulleys. Um, and, and it is uh, well utilized in commercial cargo feeder operations today. So that's, that's our initial plan. We're going to put our equipment into service in, a, uh, in the FedEx commercial cargo network, um, basically flying from you know, a lot of towered airports to non-towered airports, which is the point that I wanted to make. Arthur said making uh, aviation more accessible for more people, or something to that effect. And that, that really is the key. In the United States, we're blessed with a tremendous amount of aviation infrastructure. You know, the 5,000 paved runways that can support these relatively big airplanes around the country really supporting every small community or nearly every small community in the nation. Um, and it's an underutilized resource that this country has. And so that's really the goal, uh, you know, the initial goal is we want to, like David said, make the pie bigger. We want to increase the amount of aviation that's happening in the United States and around the world. And having to have a human on every aircraft to do that is a limiting factor. So it's natural that we would work towards a remotely piloted aircraft. Um, and from our perspective, we're working first on the autopilot aspect of that. So gate to gate, continuous, what we call continuous engagement autopilot. Um, if the pilot on the aircraft touches nothing from start taxiing, the aircraft will taxi, take off, fly the mission, fly, fly the flight to point B, land, taxi, shut down automatically without the pilot touching anything. Now, of course, you know, flights never quite go the way you plan, weather never quite cooperates, and of course there's other people in the sky. Um, so there's a lot of work to do on airspace integration uh, for remotely piloted aircraft, but also for the autonomous uh, EV tolls and, and other vertical lift aircraft that, that are coming down. So um, yeah, that's, that's generally our sketch. All right, awesome. Thanks a lot, Brandon. And, uh, I'm going to go through some scripted questions. I may have a trick question here and there, uh, but uh, then we will go to audience questions. So please uh, prepare your questions and see if you wanted to ask uh, anything uh, exciting. So let's, let's start out with the first question. I, you all kind of alluded to this fact, but there is always a question, why autonomy? What are the benefits of going towards autonomy now? Be is it the technology convergence? Is it the safety? Is it, what is it that driving this push towards autonomy? Well, a bunch of folks talked about the safety aspect. I mean, hallelujah, I think I, I agree with this. I, I, I wanna add one angle to safety, which is when you think a bit about um, the military applications as well as this technology. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the U.S. Air Force doesn't want to put their people in, in harm's way, and there's a variety of cases where they're not able to send assets to perform specific missions um, out of fear of, of putting people's lives at risk. And, and obviously, autonomy is, is an enabler for that and, and rethinking the way that uh, aircraft are operated by, by military. And then the, the other angle that I, I think about in terms of, like, you know, why the heck are we doing this, is kind of, I call it operational viability. So, you know, it's a combination of, you know, having enough pilots for, for some of these airlines to operate. Uh, to, to tell you a little story, I mean, we own an airline. It's a cargo airline. It's got pilots. Uh, the, the turnover is above 75% for these pilots. It's nuts. I mean, nobody wants these jobs. Uh, people are here for about 300 hours and then they graduate to take much higher paying jobs in bigger airlines. So we're not taking anyone's jobs. We're, we're really trying to make operating these small airlines viable. Um, obviously, the other piece is, is economical, where, where once you take out the cost of the pilot, the, the economics 
become much more favorable. I mean, these, these airlines operate on razor thin margins and it's incredibly difficult for them to stay in business in the first place. And the cool thing is once you, you start to like reduce the pilot cost significantly, not only do you become fairly profitable, but you can also expand your operations pretty significantly beyond what you're doing today. Uh, all this is, is cargo, by the way, in our case. And so we see that as a pretty near term use case. Awesome. Anybody else wants to add anything before go to the next question, or we can go to the next question? I would just, you know, you really you know, highlight the, the two things. So first and foremost is safety, and I had the privilege of, of leading a, uh, a joint industry FAA working group that looked at general aviation, and it was called the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee, and we took a Pareto of the last 10 years of fatal accidents in GA. And you look at that Pareto, and by far and away, the very leading cause is lost control. And, you, and then we dig in th through a data-driven methodology, and it was mirrored upon the commercial aviation safety team. And you see the same mistakes, which is unfortunate. I'm a pilot, and, and, it, and it's sad. I mean, I used to work at AOPA. I don't know if there's any AOPA members out there. But yeah, you see your friends uh, pass away. And so I think we have an opportunity to, re frankly, eliminate over 40 to 50% of the fatal accident causes of, of GA. Same thing as in commercial aviation. It's, it's, there, there's a reason that you know, we, we have continued to add automation into aircraft, and I think what we're doing is nothing necessarily new. We're just continuing the evolution of automation and the application of it. So it's not really a game shift. It's just a further continuation of that ev ev uh, evolution. So first off is safety, scalability as well. I mean, we're going to have many of these aircraft in a densely populated urban environment, interoperable with others. You know, I think automation is really key in moving to that digital era of aviation. So this is going to be the next era uh, of it. And I'm excited because it's going to be something that's really affordable, accessible, and equitable for all. Yeah, I think I would add just from like a, an engineering perspective, the availability of certified high performance computers is sort of a game changer over the last 10 years or so. Um, we can do things now on an aircraft, in aircraft avionics that you just, just couldn't do 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Um, I think we're also riding the coattails of some other industries. Um, you know, cellular, for example, has has brought a tremendous amount of evolution into just RF circuitry in general. So allowing us to do um, things with communication and radars that you know were were the purview of the military <laughs> even 10 years ago. Uh, you know, sort of nation state level resources. So now, though, all of those capabilities are finally sort of trickling down into the. Uh, commercial market and, and becoming things that we can certify and that's to me that's really why now from an engineering perspective. Yeah, I think to, to add to that may, maybe a, a top level answer is why now look at cars right and, and before we get to self-driving cars which which we can spend hours and hours talking let me use anti-lock brakes as an example who here especially maybe in, in, in the younger side of the audience remembers how to pump the brakes no one. I, I don't think they teach that anymore, right? Because anti-lock braking systems completely took care of it. And quite frankly, there wasn't much drama over it. I, again, I don't know anybody complaining about, geez, last time I was on ice, I, I really wish I skidded, right? That somehow that's okay. So we're doing same things to aviation, right? Yes, it's higher level. The, there's definitely more stuff to automate. But the ba basic premise is the same. You look at what human beings do well, and they do things like manage mission, right? They're creative. Is that going to get replaced by AI? Completely agree with David. Probably not. Maybe not in our lifetimes. Kind of almost pointless to discuss. But after the human being figures out how to run the mission, what to do, uh, then the, the machines are, are pretty good, right? So in our case, we've automated both auto rotations and single engine outs. And we've done a lot of flight testing with both of those. And not a huge surprise that it's very difficult to beat, actually impossible. Right, because what I tell our pilots is, you know, we're running really high degree optimization algorithms. We're running them really fast. The machine really knows everything about the state of the aircraft. And I'm sorry, human being just can't do that. So inherently that becomes safer. And you're right, high performance computing on board lets us do some really neat stuff, do it really quickly and do it reliably. Real quick on that, so it made me think of a video, and I don't know if it's online, but uh, there's a video. So WISC, again, six generations of aircraft. Our generations two and three were actually piloted. And there's a video that we have of our generation three, which had a pilot on board, and our generation four hovering. And you can see there's a little bit of a wind on the side, and you can see the pilot kind of, you know, try to find it, and, you know, constantly maneuvering, kind of. And then you see the autonomous one 
rock steady, just not even moving, like no wind. And it's like, well, yeah, of course. I mean, even when that's flown a helicopter, I mean, you know, you're constantly chasing it. Airplane, same thing, but the, 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 the computing power, the ability to kind of control that is just, you know, it's, it's here, it's now. So I guess my question is, why not? All right. Thank you for that. Uh, great answers, different insights, and uh, understanding of the convergence of technologies coming together. So let's take the second question, which is a bit harder. It's, it touches the human and society. How do you convince pilots and others who have deep insights and experience in ensuring safety for previous century, as you pointed out, that increasing autonomy is the right paradigm for the future? So yeah, maybe I'll start. Um, so a lot of this trust and experimentation, and uh, it's interesting. As I started working in Sikorsky, I, I actually ended up doing a trip to Iceland to, to help fix a, a Black Hawk. But on the way back, I was talking to the pilots who were flying. I believe it was a 757 on the way back. And I was talking to, to those pilots, and I said, so what do you guys think about fly-by-wire? And the first thing the pilot said, they grabbed the yoke and said, I don't think so. I'm going to fly Boeing because, look, I understand the cables connected to the, to the aircraft, right? And we had all the conversations about all the pilots. And, and that's where the minds are. And, and, you know, Sikorsky pilots were like that, too. And then as we even got to basic fly-by-wire flight control. So forget high levels of autonomy. Um, th there was one experiment we did where in a, in a very high fidelity simulation, we, we took an intern who was a chemical engineering ma you know, major, never seen a helicopter. Um, and I taught that person to fly in about 15 minutes to do a simple task of doing a naval vertical reposition mission. So you have two ships going next to each other, and the job is you hover over one ship, you hook up the load, and you quickly pick it up and drop it onto to the next ship, and you do this as, as fast as you can. Um, and that person was able to do that mission about twice as fast as some of the best pilots we had who have done that mission. And they're standing there and watching it, and they're saying, oh my god. And I said, well, what do you expect when you have hover hold, translational rate command, and all sorts of augmentation where you know, you had to do mental math before of trying to figure out where is the wind coming from. What well, you don't need to do it anymore. All you sit there is you do this with a thing used to be known as cyclic. Uh, we still call it cyclic for some reason. It has nothing to do with cyclic controls, but nevertheless, uh, right? And, and then it starts to crystal in their minds. And, and we said we're not trying to get rid of pilots. That's not the, the, the job here. The job here is to automate some basic flight physics and dynamics that you know, 10 years ago we had no choice. We had to teach you a lot of the really ugly stick and rudder things because, again, we couldn't fix it. We would like to fix it as an engineer, but I couldn't. Well, now I can, so we did, and that makes it safer and faster and more efficient and, you know, all of that good stuff, so, so we do. And today, for example, we ship CH-53K, which is a full fly-by-wire, right, heavy lift helicopter. We showed that we can land in, you know, dust and zero-zero conditions with no drama. And, and that's how you, you get there. You, you basically let, let the user community understand why we are doing that. Benefits, and you slowly walk up this automation chain up, up to the point where you do get to trajectory management, right? Maybe you don't need a cyclic and collective at all times. Maybe, you know, for the StarTech fans out there, right, telling the computer to do this is, is good, right? We humans understand that. And once in a while, if you feel like flying, eh, go ahead, grab the controls, fly around. That's okay. Anybody else wants to add? I think this is such a cool conversation because, you know, it's like the, the end goal is the same and there's, there's different ways to go about it. And, and, and so I, I can totally see what you, you know, why it makes sense for you guys uh, to approach it that way. The, the way that we've been thinking about it is can we crawl, walk, run operationally? Can we start with a fully featured system that's certified? But, but we fly it in remote remote areas. I mean, there's tons of essential air service that's needed. Uh, today it's not profitable, by the way, but that's, that's besides the point. It's very much needed in, in your flying cargo missions in Alaska, in, in you know, middle of nowhere. And can you start with these very limited operations to kind of build the trust over time? Uh, create viable businesses, but also really showcase to pilots that, that your system is working. Um, one interesting anecdote, so we participated recently in a U.S. Air Force exercise called Agile Flag. So, and it, it speaks to the power of like pilots seeing this and understanding what's going on and, and building trust. So, so we had a, a variety of uh, Air Force pilots flying um, re remotely piloted aircraft 
uh, in our ground station. And it started, pe people were incredibly skeptical about this whole thing. Uh, fast forward, we had flown 2,800 miles, 10, 15 missions, many different airports. People stopped thinking about it. it. It became very obvious to them how this thing was going to work. So, you know, to your point, it, it doesn't take that much to actually get people convinced. You just have to show them that it works, and and you can do do so by choosing where and how you operate to limit risk. All right, that's a that's a good good a really good insight uh, in terms of demonstrating that. Let's talk about a little bit as to how we go about getting these autonomous operations in the regular airspace, routine operations. Is there an inherent staging involved? How do you, obviously we are not going to New York City and start 10,000 operations in a day. So what's the way to think about it in terms of how do we stage this so that whether it's risk-based, whether it's crawl, walk, run. People use different metaphors for this. So what's the right type of staging to get to these operations to be more routine and more accepting? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I tend to think that the market economics are actually just going to take care of that for us. Um, we, we can really only build equipment so fast. I think the airframers are only going to be able to build airframes so quickly. Operators can only stand up operations so quickly, right? And, and so I think we'll we'll sort of naturally, as a community, get into this rhythm of, you know, another airport every week is now taking remotely piloted aircraft, another operator a week is now adding a couple more to their fleet, and it's going to take several years to to kind of roll that out. And by the time sort of the market just naturally takes care of it, um, we'll look back and say, oh well, that took a couple of years and. Everyone's everyone's making money and operating safely. Yeah, I, I just just to pile on that. I, I was talking to a colleague of mine who works in a uh, in a small UAS who delivers packages, and they're operating out of um, let's just say somewhere in the Midwest, uh, middle of the country, and um, and they have a lot of experience internationally doing the same operation, and they finally got approval here, and and. I think you get the acceptance by just doing. And so like after they started operations, people are going up to them asking for t-shirts now because they see the application. I think the same thing for WISC. You know, a lot of times, let's, let's just take New York City and, and maybe Long Island. It's kind of a nuisance. I mean, it's loud, it's, it's overhead, and you know, ultimately it's, it's, it's taking the uber wealthy from Manhattan to their homes in the Hamptons. I think if you see a WISC or, or one of my, you know, any of the AAM companies or even, you know, reliable, or X-Wing, I mean, you say, hey, I was on that aircraft the other day. I can use that aircraft for a daily. So it's benefiting me. So it's, it's, it's the ability to accept. But I think you know, what's, what I would really stress is from a regulatory and policy needs, you know, we can't unfortunately just focus on the aircraft certification and then work out, you know, because there's nothing that we can hand it to and have an airline just up and running from day one. So you really got to work a lot of streams in parallel from aircraft certification. Mm -hmm through the operational certification, so figure out how to be a 135 operator with an uncrewed, remotely supervised aircraft, but also crew. How do we? How are we gonna qualify those crew? Are we gonna take existing pilots, helicopter, airplanes? What are we need to train them for? How do we train them and get them qualified, blessed by the FAA so they can be a remote supervisor? So it's, it's good doing all of those things in parallel because you know we just can't do it sequentially. We don't have the time, and I'd probably be retired by the time we would ever get there if we, could, if we had to go line by line, line by line of business by line of business throughout the FAA to get this up and running. Igor or Arthur, you want to add anything? No, okay. Rollout needs to be staged. Agreed. <laughs> Uh, well, one of the opportunities with stage rollout also is can we do good, right? Can, can, we, can we automate some of these more dirty and dangerous jobs? Can we do, um, you know, you mentioned firefighting. That, that's, that's one where it's an insanely dangerous job. Can autonomy help with that? Yeah, yeah certainly. So safety, dull, dirty, dangerous jobs, and efficiency and productivity are the right, right reasons to start to think about it, obviously. Um, so this question always comes up, you know, because uh, there is anxiety about autonomy in some segments and such. So what would be the role of humans? That's a, 
sort of fundamental question comes. Does human have a role? If you look at the definition that ICAO presents, what is autonomous aircraft? It's no human inter full autonomous aircraft, no human intervention intervention at all. That's the full autonomous aircraft. In your own perspectives and how your product is evolving and getting matured, what are the roles of humans? Do you have a role of human? Can you speak for a little bit about that? So here, so, so maybe I'll start and we can start with a joke because I see some people starting to nod off, right? If you remember this, this there was a fairly famous joke, right? Uh, an airline pilot walking through the airport, he gets stopped by a person says, oh, you're an airline pilot, must be exciting. And he looks at him and says, not if I do it right. Um, and, and the answer to that, right, if you think about why we pay our pilots, it, it's not really when things go right, it's when things go wrong. It's because, again, human creativity, um, back to David's earlier point, right? Do you really think AI and everything else can replace human creativity becomes a very distant question, not today. Uh, machine learning as we know it, right, is, is a massive st statistics problem. It, it's great, but no, it's not emergent. No, it doesn't think. So if you put that aside and you say, look, someone really has to watch over a lot of these things and a lot of these missions and decide what really is happening, and that's the primary role of the human. And then depending on the mission, and, you know, I'll pick on firefighting. Our firefighting aircraft do, do it out there every day. You know, if you talk to the pilots who fly it, yeah, so the, the flying that is absolutely dangerous, they, they do a great job, and we are working on a lot of autonomous solutions to help them, but they're really there to assess what's going on. They, they understand the mission. So trying to take the, the human eyes out of that cockpit in that second and replace it with cameras, sensors, and whatever, we can certainly try to do that, but, but so far we have all failed. And maybe we have all failed for a good reason. I, I don't know, right? Every time I go fly, right, flying with your eyes and hands is very different than flying with a camera. It, it's just what it is. So at least our theory is that there are a lot of missions where you are going to still have people even in the cockpit with a lot of autonomy because that autonomy is keeping them safe and the person in the cockpit is running the mission. And then we can have a conversation and, and honestly none of us are really in that conversation because we make stuff, we don't fly the missions. We have to go ask our customers how to fly their missions and how they will figure it out for some missions, maybe you don't need anybody in the cockpit. It's okay to be on the ground, you know, remote lap operating vehicles. It's not an across-the-board answer, and, and a lot of it is cultural and operational, and as that becomes known, uh, you know, we'll see how it all shakes out. Anybody else wants to add? I think that's why it is. The cool thing is there's so much, you know, you touched on it, but there's certain applications where having the human, their creativity is necessary, others where you can... You can do without it, and and I think that's great. I mean, it gives room for all of us to to kind of operate. Uh, the only thing I would add is, you know, again, Whisk for sure is going to have a crew. They are just going to be on the ground, and we're going to have a remote, you know, ground control station, and we're going to have vehicle supervisors, and then we will have a, a vehicle supervisor that is above that. So multiple layers. What gets me excited as a pilot, um, you know, not everyone can go be a pilot due to maybe disabilities, physical disabilities, maybe they won't be able to pass a first class medical. By having them remotely situated at a desk supervising the operation, I think we're going to open up a whole lot of jobs to folks that would not be able to be uh, a, a pilot in a part 135 operation. So you allow them to be part of a 135 air carrier, and WISC is vertically integrated, so we'll be manufacturing the aircraft, we'll also be operating the aircraft. So we're gonna have, you know, again, to the point that we've all mentioned about this being additive, we're gonna be creating new jobs that don't necessarily exist, even mechanics. I mean, there, is there an opportunity to, to say, hey, maybe rather than go to school and be, get your AMP and learn how to turn wrenches and, and work on piston and, and, you know, all that you need to do and get your AMP, Maybe we have a tailored approach to maybe the technician route, and you qualify him or her to, to operate on you know maybe a, an autonomous aircraft that we're all, we're all developing. Then use those hours to get them qualified. Then they can use those hours to maybe go on to an AMP if they want to do so. But I think the opportunity really is you know immense as far as, far as job creation here. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. Opening the career field uh, to more people is a really important point. Um, I mean, we're we're committed to bringing our product to market with a remote pilot, I think um, th th it brings up an interesting sort of aviation, like societal kind of question, right? I mean, we currently 
hold the pilot responsible. The pilot in command is responsible for the safety of the flight. I think as humans, we want to kind of point to another human and say, look, whatever happens here, I'm holding you responsible for this. I don't see us changing that for a long time. I mean, maybe one day, you know, we're able to hold an organization responsible, kind of like a satellite operator or something. Um, but I think we're a ways away from that. So we, at, at least our, our view is we're, we're always going to want to point back to a person and say, hey, that, air, that machine that's up there, you're responsible for it. Good luck. Um, it, it, it's also a, a, a piece about being in the United States that I think is interesting. General aviation's not going anywhere. Uh, we're we're going to remain a, a nation that's pretty committed to having skies that are open, airports that are open. People are going to want to go fly at 200 feet over the desert and land and dry lake beds and I, I don't know, whatever people are doing out there in the back country. Um, and we, it's it's our responsibility as new entrants coming into this aviation system to deal with that. It's inconvenient for us. Like it would actually be a lot easier if we didn't have um, recreational pilots and recreational aircraft out there because we could just mandate equipage and make people do what we want them to do. Um, but we're not going to do that. We're going to deal with the NAS that we have. Other countries don't have that same expectation. Um, I actually expect, well, it's, it's already happening. I, I expect a lot of this technology to get fielded and deployed in countries like China first where there is no freedom to go fly, right? The military owns the airspace. You have to get every flight that you're going to do approved by an authority. Um, I can't just go start up my airplane and take my family somewhere like I do today. And and that's, I mean, I'd rather I'd rather be here uh, and, and have the freedoms that we have in aviation, but it's actually a disadvantage in terms of uh, introducing the, the technology that we're trying to introduce. So essentially you're making the remote work possible for pilots, which is, that's good. Okay. Uh, let's talk about regulatory pathway. How do we get a regulatory pathway? You know, what's the right way to think about getting regulations to get autonomous systems? in the air on a routine basis, not with exceptions and such. But. I'll start. So to me, it boils down to those three streams. So you have the aircraft certification, and we're working really closely with the aircraft certification service of the FAA in partnership. We're going through the traditional certification process, and, and but we need to you know figure out how, if you remove the pilot in the cert basis, how you deal with that. So that's an ongoing dialogue and, and we're getting there. But then in parallel to that stream, you have the operational certification. So part 135, then how do you get an autonomous operation into the 135, op specs, et cetera, routes, you name it. Then third to that is the crew. Again, how do you qualify the crew? One of the things that I've had the privilege of, of working with the FAA on is new airman certification standards. So that clearly defines what a pilot needs to know, consider, and do to be a, a safe, competent pilot. So the knowledge, the risk management elements, and then the skills. And so when you have that now is a blueprint, and you can take all those and you can functionally allocate those to systems and systems on the airplane, systems on the ground, but also people on the ground. So now you're accounting for everything that a pilot needs to know and consider do for a safe operation, just accounting for it in a little bit different way. So we're, we're not degrading safety in any way. We're actually adding to safety. And I think that's really important. So if you get all three of those streams done, and they have to be done in parallel, then we're also going to work on airspace integration. So how do we integrate them into the NAS safely and not being obstruction to any of the existing users in an equitable way? But also an instrument flight procedure, which is, for me, exciting because I need to design an instrument flight procedure that gets me all the way to the ground. So as many of you know, in the helicopter world, you, you, you find an instrument flight procedure to a point, a point in space. Then after that point, you look up and you, you identify the landing site, and then you can either proceed visually or proceed, proceed VFR. I don't have a pilot on board. He or she can't do that. So now I need an instrument flight procedure that goes all the way to the ground, like a CAT-3 approach. You know, Brandon can talk about you know what, what they did for airports. Well, I need it for heliports and airports, or anywhere in between. So that's exciting because if I can crack that nut, then that we can make that applicable to all the operators and all the manufacturers downstairs. Again, improving safety and, and making something that you work out on the, on the ground level with WISC and AAM and apply it upstream to larger platforms. And uh, you know, so we increase the safety levels across the spectrum of aviation. 
Yeah, I think I think that's really the key point is showing how the capabilities that we're developing enable operational benefit for everyone in, in aviation. Um, and I, I, I think we've got a pretty good path to getting initial operations going. We might have waivers and exemptions for the next 20 years or something. I'm, I'm not actually too concerned about that. I think we'll, everyone's going to be making a lot of money and no one will really care. But the, the, the longer term vision that I think it's important for an audience like this to kind of get is we we eventually need a new set of flight rules. A new set of flight rules that allow us to operate without natural human vision with the flexibility that we enjoy today under VFR. That's like the basic long-term vision. We've been calling that digital flight rules. There's some NASA papers. We had a committee in RTCA that, that wrote a white paper on it. Um, but it's really about taking the, the capabilities that we're all developing to have these autonomous aircraft and allowing everyone to do that same thing, whether you're on the aircraft or not, um, and get the operational benefit out of the capability. And that's really the long-term vision. And, it, and it's not just for EV tolls or AAM or autonomous aircraft. It's something that anyone could benefit from and get and, and basically take the entire visibility issue off the table through technology. My two cents on the kind of regulatory pathway is, for the most part, the aircraft certification rules under Part 23 are actually pretty applicable to uncrewed aircraft. Uh, they've been rewritten, as, you, as everybody knows here, so now Amendment 64 and 65 are much more open-ended. And, and we're not seeing a huge amount of issues with that. I think where most of the challenge comes today is, is you know, Part 91, Part 135, so all the operational rules, uh, and there, there's, there's quite a bit of exemption, exemption work that still needs to happen, just because the word pilot appears everywhere, responsibilities are really well defined. Uh, and there isn't necessarily a methodology today to go about uh, demonstrating that a certain system meets the equivalent of a pilot. And that, that, that's really the link that's missing. So today that's happening via exemptions. So we are doing the analysis, uh, but, but it's not like there's a standardized method. And I think there's a pretty big opportunity to kind of develop along that, that direction in the next few years. Great. Thank you. Oh, you want to oh, sure. just, just two quick things. Um, just to add to that, so regulation, regulatory environment. So I think the FAA rightly recognized that, hey, we have some early entrants, and WISC is not an early, the, one of the first entrants for AAM. Uh, we, we hope to be a, a close second, but we're not going to be the first. But the first are going to be piloted. And so they, I think the FAA rightly recognized, hey, the exemptions and waivers that they would need in order to qualify crew and qualify operations would be monstrous. So they did what, what's called a Special Federal Aviation Regulation, or an SFAR, for powered lift. And we're hoping that that would close here this year. And that's going to allow for a, a short-term regulatory approach to get those up and running, get crew qualified, really define that. I would encourage, though, what's after that? Because you know we, we want that industry to get up and running. We fully support that. But what's next? How do we get there, define those roadmaps so that we can hopefully maybe have another SFAR 2.0? Who, who knows? But uh, yeah, the exemption waiver process is arduous. The other thing I would just and just to add was the uh, the U.S. government's interagency working group. So the FAA rightly recognized, and, and Congress actually recognized that we should stand up an entire interagency working group that has DOT led by DOT, but also with FAA, NASA and all of the government agencies throughout. So we have a whole of government approach. So we have a strategy. They are currently drafting that right now. They're hoping, hopefully it'll be done this year. But if we have that national strategy around AAM that can include the spectrum of AAM, I think that's one way that we really define and help, help ensure that we have US leadership and a pathway to get from here and to that crawl phase with the early entrance to the walk and then the run. All right. Uh, otherwise, I'll take uh, questions from the audience. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to ask you guys, how you guys are preparing for almost zero tolerance uh, in this, like compared to ground transportation, autonomous cars are having a hard time fitting in the e ecosystem. And what happened to crews in San Francisco? We, uh, it, it just needs just one mishap and we can, uh, like the progress can halt for years and it may be just another aircraft malfunction, but without 
the pilot, uh, people were more likely to blame the autonomous or the system because it's the black box. It's the black box what people are not able to understand. The public is not able to uh, uh, understand. So how are you guys preparing for uh, almost zero tolerance uh, with autonomous? So, so the way that I like to think about it is let's start with uncrewed. No, and, and when I mean uncrewed, it's no passengers, no pilots. Right, you're f you're really limiting where you're flying. You're not flying over people, and and that way you get to build data about your system. You get to build public trust that way, and then over time you increment your way towards more complex operations. But in no way do, would I want to start with passenger operations in cities. That that doesn't seem like uh, like the right sort of crawl walk run to me. I would just add, I mean, vehicles is tough because, yeah, a lot of people think of automated vehicles, but the variables in roads, be it passengers, I mean, be it um, pedestrians, the, the, all of the, the cars, I mean, you're, you are operating within feet, if not inches, of other vehicles as well. Um, that's tough. Aviation is, is much broader. You have the third dimension and a lot of open air space, but also very regulated very defined again the whisks mission alone you're you're going from one defined operating site to another defined operating site with a very precise instrument flight procedure in between um we're not looking for a corridor per se and we're able to sense other aircraft it will be docking aircraft control uh so we hope <laughs> we laugh we, we we hope to be the most boring blip on that air traffic controller's screen because then we'll go back and forth just like pong and then if they need to contact us they can but I think there are some unfair um, assumptions. Uh, think of an automated aircraft to automated vehicles on the ground, because it's, it's just a much different and much harder nut to crack. All right. One, one, one aspect sorry, of that sorry. is just that I, I think we're all going to be hold, I think the FAA will, and we will be holding ourselves to a higher standard than would otherwise be applied to an aircraft of our size. Um, I think, you know, people trying to use small piston general aviation standards for design assurance and system safety are probably bound to have a smoking crater in the ground and fail as a company. Um, so I, I know WISC has embraced uh, that sort of mantra of being held to, to airliner or air transport standards. Um, you know, we're, we're certifying to a higher level of system safety than would other be, otherwise be required for our size of aircraft. Um, and I think, I think we're all very conscious of um, the fact that one smoking crater basically brings everyone down. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, over there. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. Very interesting conversation. Um, my background actually is in commercial air transport airplanes, and so I'm well aware of the advantages of automation, but I'm also very keenly aware of, of the creeping issue we have there on automation dependency, uh, both in terms of degradation of, of flying skills and also the reality that the human is not great at monitoring, actually. So how do we address the, the automation dependency issue in these new concepts that are coming up today? Here, maybe I'll start. Um, very simply, we design it to be just as reliable as the rest of the aircraft, right? So if you look at current autopilots today, the, the reason why you asked that question is because autopilot reliability tends to be, you know, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 per flight hour, where it's good enough that faults don't occur every day, so we don't know how to handle them, but boy, when they occur, everybody ha kind of has to wake up and say, what do I do now, right? Th that, that is the fundamental problem if you look at, you know, current state of the art. So, and again, I'm pretty sure all of us here are trying not to do that, right? That's the discussion on high level of safety. So we said, fine, so 10 to the minus nine per flight hour it is, and the failure rate of our automation will be the same as the failure rate of wings falling off our aircraft. And um, you don't need to train for it. That's the only way to address it. Anything in between, unfortunately, becomes quite useless because it, it becomes just, just another kind of self-fooling exercise. One more question. Maybe we'll take uh, two questions and then we'll do. Done. For real-time situations in the vehicle, how are autonomous situations going to handle that? Like somebody's sick, nauseous, I want access to the controls. Uh, what are the safety measures that you've in place for that? Real quick, for me, for WIS's standpoint, come see the aircraft. Um, we will have a camera on board. There's also a help button, so if somebody does get sick, uh, they can push that help button. They will talk not to the remote supervisor, who's again responsible for the safe operation of the aircraft, but a host and then or a concierge person on the ground. 
and then again, if, if, if we need to get the aircraft on the ground quickly, then that's where the, the remote supervisor will then direct the aircraft to maybe get there somewhere soon. But there's going to be people monitoring the, the aircraft on board, and then like I said, if they need help, they can get it. One last question. All right. Well, thanks a lot. The one uh, question I will ask is, uh, how can the, the newly branded VAI, Vertical Aviation International, can help you out? I'll start real quick and then, you know, pass it to Sikorsky. So, I mean, I'm a new entrant. Sikorsky obviously uh, has been an HAI and VAI member for a long time. We are a VAI member, an HAI member. We're part of a, their industry advisory council on AAM. And I think recognition that, that they are embracing this as opposed to opposing it. Because one could see that, you know, AAM in particular could be a, a, something that would be replacing their existing membership. And I think HAI and VAI rightfully recognize that, no, 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 this is additive. This is something that's going to enhance the safety of, of our existing membership. This is something that's new and novel and could be applicable to our membership. And so how do we help? I mean, they put out the roadmap that, re that they released at last year's HAI and, and getting, you know, the coalescing my fellow members and my, my fellow uh, companies together so we have a united approach. That is the beneficial definition of VAI, the ability to kind of get communities. I think yesterday they had members from EASA, FAA, and the UK CAA sitting on this stage talking about how they're communicating and collaborating. So that voice of this community talking to the regulators, talking to all of the industry players, having that united voice is really key and I can't give them enough credit for what they do. Yeah, I'd say I fully agree being an existing member of AGI for, for a while, people before me. Uh, it's expansion of VTOL space, right? So the way we see it, the sort of the more the merrier, quite frankly, and we want to darken the skies with all sorts of cool looking aircraft. Or brighten the sky. Okay, so any other question? Any? Yeah, all right, thanks a lot everyone for coming out until next year. <laughs>